Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Screams Then Silence, a film by Sheryl Sandberg, how it has become a football, a symbol of the propaganda hybrid war waged by Hamas. Our co-host for the show is Tim Apicella. Our guest for the show is Jean Rosenfeld, independent scholar. Uh, she has sent us various materials showing that Hamas and its friends planned sexual violence before October 7th. They gave the attackers uppers to exacerbate that violence, that sexual violence. Uh, in fact, just, just as a footnote, they planned short sales on the market. And that happened before October 7th. And they planned propaganda to start on October 8th, if not earlier. When the Israelis talked about the atrocities that, of that day, um, the Hamas and its friends fed the press and the social media tons of misinformation. They organized protests against Israel, people who would tear down pictures of the hostages from telephone poles all over this country. <clears throat> they called reports of the sexual atrocities a hoax over and over again. They continue to do that today. And the question we're left with, which we should discuss, is has the media done a good job in dealing with this? Uh, let me start with you, Gene. Um, from a historian's point of view, if I may, uh, how do you see these events? Well, with respect to the cases of reported atrocities on October 7th uh, by Hamas against women, Israeli women in particular, including Israeli military women. Um, this story has become part of the war in terms of it being a hybrid war and using weaponizing words. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg's film, Screams Before Silence, has seen at least 700,000 hits on the internet. She's released it for free and said violence against women uh, should never go um, unpunished and should never go un un <clears throat> unexplored. So she's explored it. And her initial, uh, her, her initial response was to an article in the New York Times uh, in December, December 28th, after the uh, atrocities were committed. And um, <clears throat> it was by uh, Jeffrey Gettleman, who's a, a New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning reporter. Her film and his article were then elaborately responded to and rebutted by a group called Electronic Intifada, which is pro-Palestinian. Without conducting any interviews of the individuals who were witnesses, both eyewitnesses and what they call ear witnesses, to the rapes and violence against women at the, particularly at the rave site that was attacked on October 7th. Um, they, they didn't conduct any interviews, but they, they took the reports and in a very sort of legalistic way, uh, they criticized them in such a sophisticated manner that it, it put me on alert because uh, propaganda is always used in war, but it's become a much more scientific and skillful uh, weapon of war most recently. And the Nazis used it against the Allies, the Allies used it against the Nazis, and the Nazis used it against their own people to create anti, a, a greater degree of anti-Semitism in the German people, who were not necessarily anti-Semitic at the beginning of the war, at least not openly violent toward Jews, but by the end of the war they were because of the propaganda ministry of Goebbels and his uh, sidekick, Adamowski. Nevertheless, this is going on now. And specific cases have been uh, undermined, and specific reports have been retracted back and forth. But there was a UN uh, investigation uh, openly uh, of the evidence, uh, or so-called evidence, of these uh, atrocities. And the UN report found them um, <clears throat> a credible belief 
in, in credible cause for belief in what happened. Nevertheless, uh, it has created a firestorm. 50 journalist professors in the United States have signed a letter objecting uh, to the reports in the New York Times of these atrocities. The New York Times, in this case, has been very responsible. It stood by Jeffrey Gettleman in his original report. It stood by um, Sandberg's film. And it conducted its own interviews. It looked at the videos and data. And Electronic Intifada hasn't done a single one of those. So whereas the original atrocities took place on a day where Hamas was in charge of the site for at least seven hours and much longer in many cases because the IDF failed to respond and these atrocities took place, there are plenty of witnesses uh, and who heard, who were in hiding and heard and some who saw what took place, but there are no videos of what took place and you can understand why not. And then when they came in to recover uh, the bodies and defend the people, they, they re the IDF and the um, first responders were under uh, threat of Hamas returning. So they had to quickly do what they did. They then overwhelmed the site at Shura where they took all the bodies. And because of Jewish religion, in many cases, the bodies were buried within 24 hours. There were no autopsies conducted. The main concern of those who received the bodies was to identify the faces. And a lot of the videos are of the faces. And others who responded who were religious Jews covered the bodies out of, um, you know, so as not to humiliate the bodies. So there were cultural reasons to obscure forensic evidence. There was very little opportunity to, to obtain forensic evidence. And there are only a few survivors, those who, actually, who survived actual rapes, who are under care right now. And this is not uncommon for people undergoing this, even to take years to talk about it, in, especially in public. And those that have come forward, the few that have come forward, have been threatened uh, with with uh, violence and, and, and received other threats. And there are other, other reasons why families want to cover this up. They don't want the children of those who have been um, subject to atrocity and murder uh, to read about it and to hear about it. So there are many reasons why you don't have a set of forensic evidence that you wish you had, but you have enough evidence as the UN report found out for uh, a reasonable cause to believe what happened. Uh, Tim, you often comment on the efficacy of the media. Your thoughts about the media in this scenario? Well, Gene has painted a picture that's given me a strong reaction, and <clears throat> particularly the lack of forensic evidence, and I understand why, for religious, religious purposes, but I'm getting a strong reaction because, uh, you know, I think back at the, you know, the trial of Nuremberg and how eyewitnesses was enough to convict, um, collaborating eyewitnesses was enough to convict war criminals. It just seems to me today, from personal experiences, I don't have a lot of forensic evidence to back up this claim I'm going to make, but it just seems in the day of technology, if you don't have an event on video, your phone, your phone camera video, um, the information you present is, is dubious or it's, it's a suspect because you don't have it on your, your camera phone video. And I, I find that disturbing because, um, you know, we have here an environment of sexual rape, gang rape, um, murder. And because we have a lack of, of video evidence, uh, you let Hamas get a toehold, a foothold in its propaganda to say it, it never occurred. Uh, look at look at Holocaust denials. Despite all the video footage of of dead bodies, dead bodies and coming out of ovens, skeletons coming out of ovens, uh, you still have this effort to deny an event that killed over six million uh, human beings. And so um, I have issues that uh, propaganda can take place because of lack of technology and and video evidence. And I think it has to stop. 
Um, why do I know this is true? Because uh, I've, I've witnessed this in the last 15 years. If you don't show something that you, you say, uh, people are suspect. I just came back from Italy. I, a car got wedged in on a, a pedestrian pathway between um, a wall of a building and a rock wall. We were stuck and it was a steep incline and the pavement was wet and it took some time to extract ourselves from this situation. Uh, when I told this event to some folks, they said, gee, it sounds like a rom-com uh, situation and it sounds a little far-fetched. Only did it, you know, five minutes later of going through all my pictures uh, that I took with my camera phone, did I show the car wedged in between the wall and the rock wall. Then they believed me. But that's kind of the point we're getting to in this society and media especially is that uh, what you present as facts because you have it gotten it in the, in the form of a photo or, or video, um, gee, we're not sure we're going to take up on this. Well, let me go back to the question I posed in the introduction. Has the media done a good job um, in, in giving us the truth? And to go one step further than that, when you get, um, you know, the evidence that was shown on October 7th, 8th, 9th, um, involving a lot of women, a lot of horrendous um, clips and and statements that were revealed to the public, some of which was so sensitive and so disturbing um, that the Israeli authorities did not reveal. But when you get all that, uh, and then you have this uh, scenario of propaganda, uh, what do you think, Tim, the average Joe believes? Uh, is it a controversy as to what happened? Is it clear that there was sexual abuse? Is it clear there was not sexual abuse? What does the average Joe think after the media has had its hand in this? Well, I mean, you don't have to show the actual act of sexual rape and gang rape to, you know, present facts. And I, I would think that most people, right after the event, took the value of what was being reported by, re by credible reporting agencies, news agencies, as being accurate and true. But, you know, again, Hamas had their, their propaganda machine ready and waiting to deny and to present misinformation, lies, and uh, it's had its effect. Uh, again, we're, we're in a polarized world, polarized nation, where depending on your news source, you may or may not get uh, an accurate portrayal of, of news. Uh, you may get alternative facts presented, depending on the news, the news source. So we're in a we're in a world where um, up means down and down means up, truth and black and white. Um, we don't know what we're getting as far as alternative facts versus facts. And again, it goes back to your news sources. And I think the New York Times, by and large, was doing a pretty good job. But I understand your point about um, an agenda. Maybe those that own the new agencies or, or are influential to a news agency may, uh, through a, pro a process of osmosis or direct influence, try to shape a story. And that's happened for a long time, decades. This reminds me of uh, Donald Trump, who during his business career and his political career has played the press. He has uh, called them and showered them with misinformation and disinformation. He has tried to control the news cycle. He has done propaganda for himself on his own account and for his friends. And he's done that consistently. So, you know, as Gene says, and as you say, we live in a world of propaganda. You would think that the New York Times and others would be able to spot this. In fact, there were all these witnesses and clips and testimonials right after October 7th. It was really hard to watch them. We're talking about people who sliced breasts off, put babies in microwaves. We're talking about people who drove nails into the vaginas of these women who killed them in the most brutal possible fashion, who stripped them naked, raped them, took them through uh, cheering crowds in Gaza City. This was really, really bad. And it all came out right afterward. And, and we seem to have forgotten that. Uh, the media, these other stories, this propaganda has covered it over. And we don't remember the original reports. Gene, um, you know, where, where does it fit here? Is Tim right about video evidence? Is Tim right about the vulnerability of Sheryl Sandberg's film 
and uh, what's his name, Gettleman's report in the Times. Uh, what about what we saw with our own eyes right afterward? Has that been forgotten? Is that not in the the, uh, the calculus? Well, two points. First, to Tim's point about needing video evidence. I think ever since Joe, <laughs> uh, George Floyd, uh, video evidence has become the gold standard. You can't always have the gold standard. We've had um, legitimate jury trials coming out with the right, probably the right uh, decision without video for most of our history. And we, can, we have developed canons of practice in law and forensics that allows us to reach a reasonable conclusion, even on good circumstantial evidence. So we don't need the videos, but the expectation that we should get the videos is a little bit over the top. Well, let me interrupt. I'm talking about the courtroom of public opinion, not the courtroom of, 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 of law. I, I mean that too, yeah. also, Tim. You're absolutely right. Um, <laughs> both courtrooms operate sometimes not on the same standards. And what I'm trying to address are the standards for the courtroom of public opinion. Um, there will always be those who will um, take the data and, and utilize the data in very sophisticated ways to bring about the opposite conclusion. And that's why we have ongoing conspiracy theories. I always say there's some germ of truth to every conspiracy theory, but then it sort of spirals out of control. And what I'm looking at is this is a story in process about extremely brutal um, activities, atrocities taking part, taking uh, taking part in, in, in war, basically, as a weapon of war. Violence targeting women, particularly. There were male victims here, but that was primarily targeting women. And it's been women who largely have been investigating this, interestingly enough. On the Israeli side, the Israeli government says this, is, this process of investigation is ongoing. They haven't come to closure either. Haaretz did a very good um, review of the data and separated out those stories that came out right away, uh, such as you know really brutal things that didn't happen. They didn't happen. And the people who reported them say, oh yes, I see now I was mistaken. I thought this, and really it was that that took place. That's good. That's When you're reporting on something, you should you know, own up, fess up. It, something was misreported. I am unaware of, of anybody who withdrew a story. So how many times did that happen? It's in the data I've been looking at. I've been looking at different sources. First of all, the number of cases you would expect uh, have been characterized as more than those we actually have credible reporting on. It doesn't really matter because you could have two cases of this happening and it would be too many because it's so extreme. But there are many more than two cases. There are a lot of witnesses that have not come forward. There are people who have given testimony that has not been reported. So in addition to saying there were stories that were wrong in the beginning, they come out to be wrong, there are many more stories yet to be to come out and there are stories that have reached a, a very high standard of reporting. There are people, for example, who hid together, who heard the same things and saw the same things that they're reporting. They are credible witnesses. You can't impugn those witnesses, for example. That's very strong evidence. And there's enough of that, particularly along one particular site. There were three specific sites that were looked at by the government and by the UN. And uh, there's one particular site along a road where a lot of atrocities took place. There's no doubt about it. And, and I'm saying this in the light of the sophisticated way in which it's been rebutted by pro-Palestinian sources. Nevertheless, the public needs to know how to view these things. If you get a report of an extreme atrocity and you believe it, and then you learn later from the same source that reported it, no, I was wrong, it can cause you to dismiss the whole story. But that's not should not be the case. 
you have to look at all of the data that comes in and is reported. And I will say, uh, Aritz has been very responsible in going through some of these stories in the long term and saying which is credible and which is not. And that's an Israeli source. The Electronic Intifada has not done any of it its own primary investigation. It's less believable, even though it comes out sounding more believable. Individuals who have reported this um, are, are scared, some of them, and deservedly so. And then there are a lot of reports that haven't yet been investigated, but the preponderance of what we know definitely supports the fact. Now, why would uh, an attacking force that was in control of the battlefield, if you want to call it that, it was a massacre actually, uh, for at least seven hours uh, without opposition and largely more than that. Why, why would they engage in something like this? For one thing, we know that there is this particular amphetamine called Captagon developed in Germany and then production stopped that has gone through the Middle East and was given to operators from ISIS terrorists and has been used in armies since in, in the Middle East, paramilitaries. And they gave these guys Captagon. They were found, Captagon was found on their bodies by the Israeli Defense Forces. And what this causes is fearlessness, sleeplessness, and high aggression. So part of the reason is that part of the reason, unfortunately, is human. If anyone has read Lord of the Flies, they know that an unmonitored, uncontrolled group, particularly, unfortunately, of young men, um, can get out of control in terms of violence perpetrated against others, against victims. And in addition to that, those who uh, came onto the scene, came onto the scene after most of the people had died. People who actually underwent this can't testify because they died. There are five, at least five known survivors and they, male and female, and they have hesitated in coming forth. They are under care. Uh, other than that, there are eyewitnesses and ear witnesses who were present and who are credible and cannot be impugned because there is no way in, in which you could say that this person has some sort of a, a reason, a religious or political, for, for denying. And then there was one very famous case of the so-called woman in the black dress who was found uh, shortly after and photographed by a woman with Israeli right-wing religious ties. But nevertheless, she and some friends came by and took photographs uh, there and and the New York Times reported on that. That was a, a signature case. Now the family has retracted it. You ask yourself, why was the family do that? The family doesn't know anything more than the New York Times or the IDF knows. They know this though. They are in care of two children who've been traumatized and they don't want those children uh, knowing what they know about what happened to their mom and dad. So. There are all kinds of reasons why the forensic evidence is not perfect. But then a uh, the electronic intifada and other sites like Intercept go and say, well, because we don't have the gold standard of, of video and evidence, this might must not have happened. Or because one uh, particular account has been retracted, this must not have happened. That All Sheryl Sandberg's film, The Hoax. Um, yeah. They call uh, yeah. uh, Gettleman's article a hoax in his book, um, and and so uh, you know it, it, it. Sorry, I'm not a historian, but this outrages me. The very issue that there's a controversy about this. You know, look at what they did to the kibbutzim. Look at what they did to the homes. Uh, look at how they drag people away. It's all consistent with the worst possible atrocities. Um, so to say that it's a hoax is just a, com a complete outrage. You know, the problem is the UN hasn't done a job on this. The problem is that the Times had to wait for Gettleman to actually say something. And the, and the public had to wait for Sheryl Sandberg to make a movie. 
And the fact is they, the media, should have been investigating this in the same way. They should not have printed the wrongheaded information. And this is what happened in Nazi Germany. I'm sorry, Tim, go ahead. You know, I'm listening to this discussion and, and the obvious is unfortunately hitting me square in the forehead here. And that is as distasteful as this may be, what I'm gonna suggest, and um, with a religious objections, um, your forensic evidence is, is literally buried. And there are something called, you know, there is something called a post-mortem autopsy. And if, 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 if this now becomes a question of all a hoax and eyewitnesses are not good enough, uh, former victims' testimony is not good enough, uh, I hate to say it, but it may be time to do a post-mortem autopsy. Would you agree that a member of your family should be um, if, know, if taken if, out of her, if, his if, or her grave if, and, and made subject to an autopsy? Listen, if my if a close family member was uh, murdered in this horrific way, and then the, the perpetrators or representative of the perpetrators um, won the world stage as far as their propaganda, and 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 told told me, my family members or myself that this didn't happen, it was uh, you know all a big lie. Yes, I would re reluctantly but willingly allow a postmortem autopsy. This fits in neatly with Vladimir Putin and Buka. Uh, where you have photographs of all these people dead on the street, and you have some of the people left left, left standing in Buka, not too many. Um, and then uh, Vladimir Putin denies it. He denies the whole thing. And as and soon as soon as you can look, it's forgotten. And I think that's part of the propaganda campaign, you know, the hybrid war campaign you talk about, Gene, um, that people listen to one side, or the other, depending on the timing, and then they forget. And I think what happened on October 7th has largely been forgotten. I think the hostages have been forgotten. And, you know, it's too bad the Israelis were not more Akamai uh, about doing their own propaganda. But in each one of these propaganda battles, controversies, they seem to have taken a, a more passive position than they should have. Um, and I think this is um, a real problem here because it not only speaks to October 7th, but it speaks to all atrocities. I mean, we're not getting the story about atrocities around the world. We don't know what's happening in Sudan. Um, you know, I was reading yesterday about all the, uh, the protest um, killings, the protesters who are killed, and there's been quite a few of them in Iran. That doesn't get to the Western press, not much. And so what happens is the terrible things happen, and they are not a lesson for us, um, because the propaganda covers them over. And at the end of the day, they will be repeated. So and I think that the organizations that care about atrocities have to move quickly. Um, they have to make the case, and if it's on circumstantial evidence, they have to make the case that way. Uh, regrettably, you know, a lot of these places in Africa, they have these truth commissions, which meet years later, years later, after it's all dead and gone and buried, and they try to find out what happened. But by then, it doesn't mean anything. It's only of use, forgive me, Gene, it's only of use to the historians. Well, <laughs> I don't know about that, what we would use it for, except to caution people from what we have learned about how to view information, which comes across to them readily now and almost too fast to absorb. How do you regard that? How do you come to some sort of reasonable conclusion about something when uh, it's, like a, it's, like, it's like a contest? It's like missiles flying. Words are missiles that are flying back and forth. So how do you deal with that? And so uh, if I have any ulterior motive here, it, it is only to uh, try and, and, and communicate what I have learned. And when you have a barrage of data, a blitz of data like this, uh, trying to figure out, see, we're emotional human beings. When we hear somebody give us a good argument, it can change our minds just from that one good argument. But if you take a deep breath and go back to that argument and examine it in light of all the other 
data or that it's trying to dispel, you can see flaws and you can see holes in it. For example, the, the, elect, the electronic intifada was quoting the UN report erroneously, but it sounded so reasonable. And when I went to the report itself, which is what you have to do, they had come to the opposite conclusion. These things really happen, but we need more time to investigate them. And to your point, Jay, typically in situations like this, where there is terrible violence, atrocity, uh, and so forth, it takes sometimes years to get to the bottom of it. You think about any kind of truth and reconciliation commission, like the one that was set up in South Africa after the many years of, of war there, civil war there, um, it didn't really get set up uh, for many years. Look at Nuremberg and the trials that took place in Germany after Nuremberg, which most of us haven't heard about. Um, it, it takes a time in, in a scene of chaos and war, threat and fear, atrocity and, and, and shock and trauma. Um, you, you have to weigh and sift and then people either come forward or don't come forward or come forward late. So the, the one thing you can ask of the media is don't come to a premature conclusion, report things. And when things are retracted, retract them, but caution people not to just listen to that one retraction as retracting the whole story. And then, you know, do your own investigation. In addition, don't just take what people tell you. And the, and the preponderance evidence in, and Sheryl Sandberg's film is a case of presenting some of that evidence, actually a lot less than it exists, is that in addition to uh, staging a surprise attack on a defenseless population, the Hamas had the ability to, and probably the opportunity and intention of shocking Israeli civilians to the extent that they would be very fearful and, and shocking uh, them into compliance. Uh, these were horrific. They were multiple. Um, they were patterned. Um, and they were almost inevitable. Jim, um, do you want to change your testimony about anything? No. <laughs> let me let me throw some some I, other factors in here. Number one is, um, you know, I, this is like. It's like climate change being the biggest story of our lifetimes, of our planet, okay? Because it it's coming for us. It is visibly coming for us. And in the Middle East, the story that is the biggest story is the hostages. They're still there. And God knows how many have been killed in captivity. They haven't been released. They're still part of the hybrid war, okay? And so we have all this, um, you know, quote, controversy over whether it was a hoax. But in fact, we have 100 plus people that are held in, in brutal, if not fatal, captivity. That's one factor. The second factor is that what Hamas did that day, what it would do any day, is driven by pure and unadulterated, unadulterated hatred. Hatred from the time they are small children, trained by UNWA and others to hate Jews. This was motivated in large part by that kind of hatred and anti-Semitism. And part of the reaction, in, I suggest, in the media, part of the reaction of those kids who pulled pictures of the hostages off telephone poles, uh, who have um, you know, protested in favor of Hamas um, and the Palestinians and Iran, for that matter, um, those people are also, you know, you got to ask whether that is driven by the same kind of anti-Semitic hatred. Those are two other factors I want to throw at you, Tim. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I, I, I'm having a tough time with this topic um, because what Hamas did is, yes, it's inhumane. <clears throat> it's war crimes, uh, and they should be held accountable. Um, but remember... Our history is laden with war crimes, uh, be it from the Vikings attack on England and France and the you know, 
the, the horrific rapes that took place uh, to Lieutenant Callie and My Lai and the rapes and murder that took place or the horrific uh, war crimes of the Serbs against the Bosnians. Uh, we have a long stretch of history of, of what is a, an overt attempt to disrespect, uh, degrade a society, a different, a different peoples, uh, and, and then as Gene well said, to shock them into fear um, this was all planned, but this is not, uh, you know, this is not an anomaly. This is, this is a pattern of aggressive history of, of, of peoples attacking an, a, another population. And are we shocked? Yes, because it's happening present day, but from a historical perspective, we not, should not be surprised. But what I reject or what I really, uh, I find, I find um, offensive is the amount of time it takes to get to the bottom of the truth that you could aggressively prosecute perpetrators of war crimes. And I, I, I don't know what the rationale for these timelines. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of um, the, the attacks in Rwanda, uh, 700,000 dead. And how long did it take to start looking and investigating on, on who perpetrated, who were the leaders of this genocide? So I, I I, I, I really resent the time it takes to get to the bottom of it. I understand you have to let the conflict clear out first and, and, and go through the evidence in a rational, calm manner, and you can't do it in the heat of passion, but um, something needs to be done about what happened on October 6th, and certainly much, much faster than if we were to take years to get to the bottom of it. Yeah, let me uh, go to Eugene for final comments, because we're very nearly out of time here. Just suppose we make a full investigation. And uh, I, I, I would say it's the United Nations, but I know it won't be. Somebody makes a full investigation. Maybe it's the media, you know, maybe, maybe not. And we find out that, yes, all or essentially all of the atrocities that were reported right after October 7th happened, actually happened. All those stories about the rapes and the abuse and the uh, unspeakable things they did to people, to women. Um, let's say we find out who is going to be accountable. Those kids who came from Gaza were wearing masks. We don't know who they are. We don't know who did what. As the best we can do is to say, yeah, they did those things. But who's they? Will they ever, 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 ever be accountable? Well, Jay, these are not usual cases. Yes, Tim, they've happened, unfortunately, happened in history. And they happen again and again because of human nature, unfortunately. Given the right circumstances, or in this case, the wrong circumstances, you can kind of expect it to happen given the opportunity and the IDF wasn't there. They weren't there during a critical period of time. Secondly, individuals who have been so traumatized and who know if they come forward on a world stage to rebut a propaganda campaign are going to be likewise attacked. Uh, they have to be heroes to come forward. How many heroes do you know? And truly, uh, the minority of us are heroic. We should learn only us three for now. I know. We should learn how to how to uh, in a general sense respond, but and to protect those who come forward. But we don't. We don't protect whistleblowers. You know, are generally punished, and so for a variety of reasons, and because of the scope of this and the trauma of this, and the fact that there's an ongoing war. I didn't mention this, but another tactic in the propaganda war is to bait and switch. If a story is too horrendous, like Sandberg has brought to us front and center, and I thank her for doing it. I mean, I wish she had done a, a more shocking job of showing us the videos she looked at, but she spared us, she thought, but for good reason, she should have showed us. Um, despite all of that, there will be some kind of an accounting. In the UN report by Pramila Patton, and I give her kudos also, uh, she's not conducting an investigation. She was there to do some 
reporting on uh, what she could find out in a brief period of time. But there is an ongoing UN investigation. There is an ongoing uh, Israeli investigation. And I will say that in both cases, I really do trust that they are being honest and straightforward about what they're doing. Of course, there's no Hamas investigation. A lot of the perpetrators have probably died in the war. And Israel is responding to the atrocities and its own failure to defend their own people with a savage, savage degree of um, warfare on the ground, kinetic warfare, trying to eradicate Hamas. And now- Well, trying to get the hostages released. They the are still not released. The hostages are at risk under these circumstances, which is why you need a ceasefire and to trade other prisoners for them, just as we saw the Biden administration do with Russia. We need to cease the hostilities and get the hostages out of the way. Yes, they are being abused. Yes, we have credible evidence. A survivor has come forward and given credible evidence. Other survivors have reported they've seen other people subject to abuse as hostages. So yes, but in terms of the war itself, the kinetic war on the ground, what Israel has done by assassinating Hamaya uh, in uh, Tehran is set the whole region on edge and then elevate Yahya Sinwar to the head of Hamas. He's a guy who is so extreme that even Hamas people who wanted the first ceasefire couldn't convince him. Now he's got absolute power. So the war on the ground is becoming more savage and the war of words is becoming more volatile and extreme. We should know how to separate the sheep from the goats when we hear the war of words. Let me ask you this rhetorical question, Jean. Let us assume the Israelis do a masterful job. And let us assume that the three of us believe it. They be we believe, and a lot of people would believe what their conclusions were, what their evidence was. Um, will that somehow, I hate to use this word, Will that somehow trump the controversy? Uh, will that somehow avoid controversy? Or will the people who have been engaged in this propaganda just call the whole thing a hoax again? Well, there will be those like the Holocaust deniers who will never believe it, but they will become a marginal voice. Ideally, what would happen over the years is we would have a permanent peace, and then we would erect monuments to the victims. And we would okay. keep their, their names alive in perpetuity. Tim, I'm going to ask you to uh, wrap it up. Um, I'm glad we're talking about it, as difficult as this topic is. Um, it needs to be discussed. Should not be forgotten in other news headlines. Uh, I would like to see, you know, um, the propaganda put to breast. And I think you do that by doing some tough things, making some tough decisions about getting forensic evidence to the table. Um, but I, I'm glad that, Gene, you brought this to our attention, and I'm glad we're, we're discussing it today. And I, I think that uh, the world needs to realize that this should not be forgotten and moved on from. October 7th is a date that should not escape the minds of world population. No more should the attacks in Rwanda, the, the genocide in Rwanda, no more than future genocides are yet to occur that should not. We're going to have to leave it there. Um, but thank you so much, Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar, uh, and Tim Apicella, co-host and commentator. Aloha to you both.